welcome to the Downtown Podcast. Thanks for coming out to this gallery to spend time with us. I'm really excited every time we have a community segment where we get to speak to some Progression Labs graduates. So um, we're very lucky tonight to speak to three. And um, for those that don't know, Progression Labs is a three month like boot camp for startups to develop their ideas. And when they graduate, they get to go out and launch their product. And they, they um, turn themselves out into the real startup world where they can then become rich, famous, and everything else that they want to do once they get there. <laughs> Alan, we're going to Hello. speak to you about your startup. However, um, I'm going to get you to do the fortune of the week first for us. So you can take any fortune cookie you like. All right, any fortune cookie, I'll take this one. Great. And Alan, our fortune cookie handler, is going to come and take that for you. Here you go. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. <laughs> So, second Alan, first Alan, second Alan. Second Alan, okay. <laughs> Alan, tell us about your startup, Ling. Okay, so um, Ling is an app that helps you learn a foreign language through texting. So, uh, if you go on the web nowadays and you search that you want to learn foreign language, I'm sure you'll find a lot of resources. There are a lot. But you and I both know that learning a foreign language is still hard. And the reason why it's hard is because you still have to commit yourself to doing something on a very regular basis. Yes. So uh, instead of just making like one more, you know, the foreign language app that requires something from you, we decided to put language learning into something that you're already doing as every day, which is texting. Brilliant. So uh, say if we were learning uh, Italian mm -hmm. and you text me, Alan, I am eating in the kitchen right now. What I would see on my app link would be, Alan, I am eating in the cucina right now. Mm -hmm. So the app will smartly swap out a word or two in the foreign language equivalent. So you will be able to sort of learn vocabulary through both context clues, as well as just seeing this word a bunch of times in your own social conversations. I love this idea a lot. It feels very much like accidentally on purpose learning, which, yes. which I think is, uh, mm -hmm. is definitely more motivating than having to find the time for it all the time, like you said. Precisely. And when you send text to people, like the context of what you're sending would probably help you remember to those words that right. you sent. Precisely. Because you look at it, you think about the word, and you actually see how it's spelled. So right. that's awesome. Thank so you. have you launched yet? And if not, when are you going to be launching? Sure. We're actually hoping to launch either by the end of of this month or at least early October. That's really exciting. You guys seem to have been very, very busy while you were at Progression Labs. Yes. That's we awesome. <laughs> so for people that want to uh, like stay in touch with you and um, mm -hmm. find out when the app is actually launching, I, I know that I do. I want to be able to learn a new language. Um, how can they get in contact with sure. you? Sure. So the best way would be Twitter. And it's just learn with Lang. So. It's nice and easy. Thank yep. you so much, Helen. That's Thank awesome. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Brooks, Hi. so we did a bit of a hackathon together in October, right? Yes, uh, yeah, October last year, the fashion hackathon, mm -hmm. when you won with the first place prize. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, I was working on a, sh a shoe app at the time, and that was sort of the precursor to Flight Gear, which is why I'm in Progression Labs. So you got a bit of revenge on me. I may have won the <laughs> hackathon, but you actually got to take your idea and make it a real thing it, in Progression Labs, right? Slowly, it's been <laughs> a side project. Um, and I think the, the exciting thing is with Progression Labs, I really got a chance to discover what was interesting about this idea. Nice. And so now what Flight Gear is, it's a, a discovery app for sports gear. And as you use it, um, it learns what your interests are. So it will present to you uh, in an explore view, like a photo sharing type app. Um, it'll present to you everything, but as you use it, it'll figure out, okay, you like skiing, you like Jordan sneakers, you know, I'm gonna show you Oakley goggles. I'm gonna show you what's coming out um, in two or three months and kind of surface that content. I find that like outdoor gear or like sporting gear is really fragmented, right? And you kind of never know what's going to come out. Like they focus so much on shifting existing gear. So users can almost find out like the kind of cool things that are coming out soon too, right? Yes, I think that's part of it is it's a social status thing mm -hmm. for some people to <laughs> sort of be on the cutting edge of, of sports gear. You're wearing like the latest North Face or something like yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and so they're kind of the trendsetters. They're going to kind of show you what they want. Um, and it's good for brands too. They can kind of see what people, what's trending in the app. 
Um, but it's, it's a place to just share and discover and, and kind of talk about what, what is cool in sports gear. Awesome. So congrats for um, graduating Progression Labs. What's next for Flight Gear? Um, so I'm going to be launching the app in two weeks. Got to finish up a few things with iOS 8 and the uh, iPhone 6. So it'll be an iOS app only um, at first. Um, Android will be a, uh, a little bit later. Um, so that's in about two weeks. And if you need to kind of keep up on what's mm -hmm. happening, you can go to flightgear.co. Oh, that's a really that's great CEO. domain. Good yeah. job. Do you have a Twitter account or anything like that? Um, I, I do, but it's just for my own. So my name, Brooks Holiday. Fantastic. It's, and then yeah. flight, flightgear.co? Yep. Fantastic. Well, I wish you all the best. And I'm excited to see your app launching on iPhone first. Thanks. Thank you so awesome. much. Cool. Kingsley, yes. you are the next person we're speaking to for the Progression Labs graduates. So tell us all about your product and what kind of came out of prog your Progression Labs state. Okay, so our, uh, our product is LeakCoin, mm -hmm. and we're a competitive gaming platform where gamers can play against each other online for Bitcoins. So we're kind of taking the same concept as like online poker, but applying it to video games. So now we're enabling you know, really good skilled players or not so skilled players <laughs> to play for anywhere from like, you know, 10 cents a game to, you know, thousands of dollars a game. This is such a great idea. I imagine that there's some very hardcore gaming groups out of there too that would be not only really interested in this, but like a really great community that you can hook into, right? So what's the first game that you're going to be doing this with? Uh, we launched next uh, Friday, September okay. 26th, That's with yeah, with League of Legends. So wow. they have a huge player base. It's uh, something like over 70 million monthly users. That is staggering. So we're just hoping to get a small uh, small minority of that. <laughs> just and, and, just uh, a couple of billion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And uh, you know, it will be a big hit. So that's really, really cool. Yeah. So when you think about people trying to earn bitcoins, normally they're mining them, and you get like little tiny dribs and drabs as you go along. And of course, it gets harder and harder as they make the algorithm harder. But when people are gaming, you know, it's you said it's like a poker kind of aspect. So um, people can win much bigger, but also lose much bigger, right? That's kind Correct. of funny. Correct. Yeah. So we kind of feel like, uh, you know, like I mentioned that low-skilled players, they'll be playing for less money, and high-skilled players will be playing for more. Kind of the same as poker. That's really, really cool. So you're launching this Friday. Um, next Friday. Next Friday yeah. coming up. Um, have you thought about the different other games that you want to branch out to next? We're looking, right now we're in the uh, uh, PC gaming. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at all popular PC games. Uh, Dota 2 is on our radar, nice. uh, StarCraft 2, pretty much any game that we can support. I hear Counter-Strike maybe? Oh yeah, and, yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah Counter-Strike yeah. and uh, Team Fortress 2 are on. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. So if people want to follow you online to find out when all that stuff is kind of coming into the games near them, like how can they do that? So yeah, they can check us out at LeeCoin.com or just on uh, Twitter, just LeeCoin. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Kingsley. Yeah, thanks. And uh, please give a round of applause to all of our fantastic Progression Labs graduates. <laughs> So you guys, we're about to talk marketing. One, because we need it as a podcast. We just started marketing and it's made a big difference. You can see more and more people showed up, but it's a tricky thing and it's a word that's kind of got a lot of uh, overhead. So we're gonna try to cut down to the most important pieces. And today we brought somebody who has a lot of experience marketing overseas. He helped a company called Mad Rabbit Kicking Tiger 
which creates bags, accessories, ex inspired by architectural concepts. And he took this company and made it popular in several different countries. So there's a, something really interesting about the way he's able to find different cultures and still make it popular that we think maybe we can learn for our startups. And then he also is the founder of the Unbelievable Testing Laboratory, which creates technology-driven footwear that pushes the boundaries of design and function. So we're going to learn more about how he was pushing those boundaries. Please put your hands together for Sean Nath. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Boom. Boom. Got, got some fans on. Marketing. <laughs> Marketed to the front row, front left. <laughs> key, yeah. Key to marketing is is, is seating. Front <laughs> left. Yes. <laughs> I like it. Okay. So I was really surprised about all the different places you've lived, all the places you've been. Yeah. Why so many places? Um. Okay. Well, when I was when I was growing up, I grew up in Southern California, um, and I, I really didn't travel much. My family took you know very regional vacations and things like that, but. Um, with my friends, we, we were into different things like sports, and I played soccer, and I played football, and did things like that. And we were uh, probably our biggest passion together with, with my friends was, was surfing. Okay. And surfing for us was all about exploration. Um, we'd, once we were able to drive, especially, we'd go further and further and further to the point where we're telling our friends' parent or our parents that we're spending the night at a friend's house and we'd be in Mexico for the weekend or something <laughs> like that. So um, addicted to those waves. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, although, although international travel was not a big part of my upbringing, I definitely had a, a, a youth or, or a childhood where you know, it was all about exploration and, and sort of pushing that boundary further and further geographically okay. until by the time I was in college, I got the opportunity to study abroad. Um, I applied for a scholarship, and I said, if I get it, I'm going to go. So I got it, and, and then you went. I went to France. I lived in France for a year, had a beautiful time, and it just so happened that the uh, university system in France had shut down uh, for a good part of that time yeah. due to, to some student strikes, and my, uh, <laughs> my scholarship stayed intact, and I just traveled around Europe for a while. <laughs> so I learned a lot, and uh, it sparked a fire, and uh, came back from that. Um, looked at what other options were available, and then there was an option to go to Hong Kong. So mm -hmm. I said, well, I've been to the West. The land, of, the land of dreams was calling you. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I applied for another right. scholarship and said, if I get it, I'll go. And I got it, and so I went. And, um, so you just made these bets with yourself, so and then, then it's yeah. kind of whatever happens, you end up changing <laughs> yeah, your life I mean, around I'm, it. I'm, I'm a somewhat logical person, uh, believe it or not. And, um, you know, it, it's sort of like if it, if it makes sense, why not do it? Um, even though going and doing it seems risky or somewhat um, adventurous, to me at that time it was like a no-brainer. Like, well, right. of course I'm going to go. Um, so I went to Hong Kong, got to travel in China. And then how did that turn into the um, mad rabbit kicking <laughs> tiger? Yeah, thing. yeah. So um, I, I think growing up with the action sports kind of all around me in, in Orange County in California and seeing that, I always had an interest in brands. Um, and after I graduated, I, I left Hong Kong, and I actually moved to France again. And I worked at Quicksilver, um, which is a major surf brand and things like that. And this was around like, well, it was like 2008, 2009, where um, things started to go sour. And so I was looking at what else to do. And I had some friends in Shanghai, and they said, you, you should really come back here. So I just went. And I, okay. you know, no job, nothing like that. Um, had friends back so home. So tell me, like, when, so they were like, come out because there's great opportunities. Like, how yeah. do you assess that? Because I know a lot of us, like, you're like, hey, join my startup. Like, come do this yeah. thing. Like, what do you, what does that mean, like, <laughs> tangibly, what you look for? Oh, I wasn't looking for much. <laughs> oh, I was, I was very, move. I was quite young. Um, I think I was 23 at the time. And I was just 24 and looking for something interesting to do, somewhere to go. I had nothing to lose. Um, it wasn't like I was giving up a, a you know, major, major corporate job or right. a lot of responsibilities that I had. It was like, okay, why not? Let's go try right. it for six You've months. You've been chasing the waves. and Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And um, I went out there and I started, um, kind of, you know, I had friends back home in California who were in action sports and things like that. And they were asking me for things because, oh, my buddy's in China. And um, ended up through that um, over the course of a couple of years growing a pretty successful business. 
um, that was in product design, development, sourcing, and that sort of thing. And part of my, I, I guess part of my passion was missing, which was the branding side of things. And, and that's where it kind of gets into the marketing discussion. But right. um, I was very much involved in factories and product development and sort of the innovational side. Um, when my interest in brands from the, the, the get-go had always been in the lifestyle. And um, I, I think what that time gave me in those first years in China was a very like on the grounds, hand on, hands on how to get something done, how to get it shipped, how to get it to where it okay. needs to go. You know, very logistical, very... Right, you got your brain thinking about how it actually, yeah, how the whole yeah. system works. Yeah, if someone has an idea, how do you actually do it? Okay, so once you kind of understood that, what are the lessons that you could teach us possibly about knowing that system and like something we could apply right off the bat? Knowing that system, ooh. Um, <laughs> well, we're well, actually maybe tell it. Maybe tell the Doc uh, Martin story. Like, I yeah, mean, maybe yeah. you could like we could use an example. Like, what do you think made that catch in such a different market? Yeah. Well, you know, that's that's a really epic branding story. Um, it's it's a brand you know that has it's it has a product that's really geared toward construction or, or military use. Right. It's a boot. It's a boot. It, you know, right. it's a heavy boot, and somehow that boot is about music. <laughs> how did, how, did, <laughs> All that, about how music. did that happen? Um, you know, every brand's a little different, and sometimes you deliberately go about doing something, or you put yourself in the position for something to happen, um, and, and it just happens. And, and those occasions are rare, and everyone tries to put themselves in those positions. But sometimes, I, in, and more so in the case of like Doc Martens or a couple other brands like that, something happened to them. Um, people discovered it and said, you know, this, this is the look I want. Mm, so it became gotcha. a look, and it, something they did well was they were able to pivot, right? They are able to say, okay, we are about music. And they are able to quickly go in that direction. So um, that's the sort of connection that I was missing in my really nuts and bolts, factory floor, product development side of my life in China. Right. And it's what I wanted to get back into. Um, that sort of psychology, that sort of emotional side of the brand, where that you know piece of fashion allows somebody to be the person they want to be, to portray the you know the image they want to portray, right. to tell the world something. Okay, and then just as we're starting to run low on time, tell me about uh, Kickstarter. Like you had an amazingly successful run on it twice. Yeah. Like what yeah. is it that, especially <laughs> small fashion? entrepreneurs could maybe learn from. Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the brands I'm involved with, I'm the co-founder of uh, Unbelievable Testing Laboratory, which is a Love the name. footwear yeah. brand. Yeah, Unbelievable Testing Laboratory and uh, Mad Rabbit Kicking Tiger. So <laughs> I love it. <laughs> a bit love unconventional. It. But um, yeah, when we went about doing a Kickstarter for us, it was just a natural place to be because our target was people who are into technology and innovation. Mm -hmm. And that was it, uh, mostly men. and that was where they were. And so that made a lot of sense. And it, it just so happened to be a, a sort of less risky place to launch a brand and a place to say, OK, let's see what people want. Do they want this? Right. So the first time we did it, we went about it with this um, yellow Tyvek shoe we call the pencil. OK. And um, <laughs> it happens to be a pair there. Um, oh, that's the shoe? Yeah, they're very iconic. And it, whenever you see them, you, you definitely know what they are. Oh, yeah, it's like the little eraser. <laughs> yeah. It looks like she could erase yeah. with her toes. It's, it's, it's a big part of why we chose Dance that shoe. Dance on a that, chalkboard or that something? Shoe. Or on a um, pad. Because we knew, like, uh, on Kickstarter, you know, what really made a Kickstarter is, like, media. So right. we built this thing with, you know, friends and family support to get us over this certain level where the media would kick in. And um, our first go around, I mean, it was just amazing. We look at the first 100, 200 backers, we know everybody. Yeah. After that, it was sort and of into the up. ether, yeah. and it was really amazing, and it was on <laughs> GQ and Hypebeast and all these great things, yeah. and uh, took off and became a thing. And then we went back to it um, this last June, which was a year after our first one, yeah. with a new shoe, co shoe called the Ninja, which is a, a minimalist sort of travel shoe and beat our old record. We sold 2013 pairs of the, the Lightwing, which is the, the Lightwing pencil, which you saw there. And then we sold almost 3,000 pairs of the Ninja. 
That's um, awesome. Which are just being delivered now, by the way. So if you okay. if you backed us, you're, you you should expect it tonight. Expect it soon. <laughs> I can imagine that moment. Like, hey, is this anybody's grandma? Anybody on this order? And yeah. Like, no, yeah. no. It's that somebody new. It's somebody yeah. we don't know. Yeah. And that was I the cool thing about that moment, cool so. thing about the ninja was we didn't know a lot of these people. So yeah. it was like we somehow had gained some traction, and we saw that. People we didn't know were interested in our products. That's awesome. And that's always like a really great thing. Okay, so before we do this song, before you give a couple call to actions, how could the community support you? Any URLs we could follow? Yeah, Any yeah. blogs? And are you gonna be maybe afterwards talking to people? Yeah, I'll be around. Be um, okay. Definitely come see me. Um, Twitter, uh, I have two brands, so at the UT Lab and at MRKT Bags um, for my brand Mad Rabbit Kicking Tiger, which you could probably find it. Um, a number of retailers like Urban Outfitters and stuff like that. Okay. Well, you've had a couple sips of your beer, but get ready to drink a whole lot more because we're going to sing you our famous drinking right. song. <laughs> so, Eleni, if you could cue it up, and Jonathan has the lyrics over there. So, thank you for coming and talking to us, and we are going to sing you into a drunken oblivion. <laughs> to our ups and downs, we gather around and sing a drinking song. A toast to those we love the most in the place where we belong. Cheers! Thank you. Sponsor um, from Great Ep Great Expectations, KJ. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really enjoying this. I spent many years downtown, and we didn't have this. Yes. When, in the 70s I and mean, in the 80s. <laughs> it's you know, come oh, quite a long way. Oh, this is wonderful. I think it's terrific. Yeah. So first off, thank you for bringing um, a bottle of your wine, and yeah. I think we've almost killed the bottle. Well, I hope so. So, um, I so have seven cases in the car. So. <laughs> I'm going to need you to go get those in a minute. <laughs> so first off, tell us a little bit about the, the team building experience that Grape Expectation has. Well, what, what we are is a private client winery whereby groups or individuals come and make a barrel of wine. Now, a barrel of wine consists of 240 bottles or 20 cases. And it takes 756 pounds of grapes to make that one barrel of wine. But now people can't come and handle 756 pounds of grapes because it's almost impossible. So we require our growers to hand pick the grapes in the vineyard and put them in 36 pound crates, put them in a refrigerated truck, send them over to the winery in Henderson, and then you and your group come at an appointed time and you actually start the five step process, which begins with crushing and destemming the grapes, yeah. fermentation, pressing, Later on, in the, after the Super Bowl, we do racking, and then we do bottling in, uh, in May. And then also in May, we bring grapes in from South, from, uh, South America, from Chile, and so we have year-round production at the winery. And so we have about 3,250 people making wine with us right now. And everything starts this Saturday. The grapes are a couple week early, weeks early, the harvest is, so we've been accelerating our uh, preliminary activities over there, working a lot of hours, getting ready for all yeah. that onslaught of people and the grapes, and the people. That the fun thing is the social aspect of the winemaking process because the actual uh, work it only takes about 45 or 50 minutes, but people come 
an hour before, and they stay for three hours later, because they bring wine and they bring food, and some bring their own chefs, and uh, there's a lot of team building among those groups as well. Mm -hmm. The different hotels get together and they'll uh, bring their groups and uh, uh, some of the restaurants get together and they want to outdo each other with food. But part and parcel to the whole process is the individual groups who just like wine. And they come and they make wine, they have a, they have a ball. And we have about 85% retention every year in our clientele. So oh, wow. that just shows you. We, we, went from a, we went from a place that was about 3,000 square feet to we're at 12,200 square feet now, so we're pretty big. And we're very proud of what we do, and we're proud of the support that we get from the community. So Yeah. So when you speak about team building experiences, that's a long process, though, because it starts, but then it goes on for how long? Well, it starts in October and then ends in May, but you only have to be there four or five times, except for the parties. We have Christmas parties. We have barrel rub parties. We have St. Patty's Day Parade, which starts with a Bloody Mary party. And, uh, <laughs> ends up with a drinking party back at the winery. So there's all kinds of activities through the year. We also allow our winemakers to use the facility for birthday party, company party, or just a barrel rub party just to have some fun because they're always going to bring somebody that has never been there. Yeah. And that's our marketing strategy. I don't take many billboards out. I don't take much radio and TV. This is what we like, the social media yeah. and the show and tell. So. So how do groups decide what they're going to make? They're, they don't know anything that's, about That's wine. one of the things. Like if you get that bottle of wine right here and it says, uh, let's see what this bottle said. It says uh, Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot. I also happen to know that uh, it has some Cabernet Franc in there as well. But just because a bottle of wine says it has Cabernet Sauvignon in it, it only has to have 75%. So most people, they have no clue what's really in the bottle of wine they're drinking unless it's written on the back of the label, which more and more wineries are doing now. But for the most part, they don't have a clue. So I ask them to come to the winery, bring a bottle of wine you like, at least five, six, eight bottles of wine, and okay. we'll figure it out. And of course, we come to consensus with a little bit of a <clears throat> headache, maybe, and a <laughs> little bit of tipsy, but I will guide them along the way because you're gonna have some people who like a Moscato, and other people who like a Rhone Valley and other people would like a Chianti, which would be Sangiovese base. And so we figure out what the consensus likes. Then we order the grapes and they come in from our, <coughs> excuse me, from our growers that are in the north coast in California, from uh, Napa and Sonoma and Russian River, Lodi, Amadora Valley, all up in the, that, that region. And uh, they come in and then they make their wine. And most of them like it because they keep coming back for more. Yeah. <laughs> So outside of grape expectations, and inside sources told me you're quite a character when you're drinking wine. I hear there's like a New Year's Eve story that involves a Christmas tree that got in your way. Oh, good God. You want to touch on that? <laughs> Just because I feel like this group would really appreciate uh, that. I don't know if you see the, uh, if there's a hotel that has a B on the top down here. I used to have an M on the top. That was the Mint, the Mint Hotel. Some of you might know the Mint 400 Desert Race, which I was part of. But anyway, the Mint was a Del Webb property. And one of our uh, purchasing agents decided he was going to uh, decorate with Christmas decorations right after Halloween. And he put a Christmas tree right in the most inopportune spot at the top of the Mint restaurant where everybody that had to go to the restroom would pass by it and would knock into it. And of course, I mean, I was beside myself, but my boss said, listen, let it, uh, we'll, we'll change it next year. Because this is all out of my budget, all this money that we were spending. Christmas Eve, I mean, New Year's Eve comes, we have a New Year's Eve party, we go to the top of the mint, we start dancing, and I have to go to the restroom, and I knocked into that Christmas tree, and I said, enough's enough. I drug it from its perch, <laughs> I took it across the dance floor at the top of the mint, and up to the pool deck, with the top of Binion's, there's a pool up there, and threw it off the top. <laughs> now, we have, at the mint, we had the, the top four floors have an outside terrace. So you can look down the strip. This is before the Golden Nugget was built. It blocked a little bit of the view. But anyway, unbeknownst to me or anybody else, there was a couple out there having their champagne, and they thought somebody had committed suicide. <laughs> <laughs> so the, you know, the fan was hit with some kind of uh, stuff. And <laughs> anyway, about January 5th, my boss, boss calls me in and says, KJ, what the heck did you do New Year's Eve? I said, well, I was with you. We did the party. We did the 
He says, no, later. He said, well, did you moon anybody? I said, of course, I moon everybody every, <laughs> every New Year's. Uh, he said, but what about, did you throw the Christmas tree off? I said, yeah, I did throw it off. He said, well, they are really after you down in Phoenix. They are really angry, and I've got to suspend you. I said, suspend me? Well, for how long? He said, for a month. I said, for a month? Uh, starting when? He says, that now. I says, oh, okay. So I went back to my office, got my secretary to get Delta on the phone. They got me a flight, I went to Europe, and I skied in the Alps for a month. <laughs> True story, now my boss goes down to a big meeting, big corporate meeting down in Phoenix, and he says, uh, well, the president of the corporation says, uh, how's KJ taking his punishment? And he says, are you kidding? How's he taking his punishment? He could never get a month off from me. <laughs> He's over in the Alps skiing, and he had to have it all. So anyway, that's kind of that story, but it's true. And John L. Smith, in his column, alluded to it about a year ago in the, when the Binions closed their rooms. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, he, he called me and asked me. And I told him I did not, I was not naked when I threw off the Christmas tree. <laughs> that's always a plus. Quarter, and that was the part. That was the part. I said I did moan, but I was not naked. So I don't know if this story is good or bad advertising for wine, but... It's all about making your mark, right? Well, yeah, and yeah. people know you, and I know people. People know me out at the winery just for that little, that little bit that I did <laughs> New Year's Eve yeah. 30 years ago. <laughs> they never forget it. But anyway, that was the fun. That's all the right. Fun. So people can find you on your website, grapeexpectationslasvegas.com, right? And then they can email you at you make the you wine. You make it the wine. You make it the wine at AOL.com. At AOL.com, because we make it the okay. wine one barrel at a time. And any one of you that you can come out there any time and watch the process, remember that, hey, I saw you on the show, and please bring whoever you like. I'll show you the whole process, and you'll have some fun, I guarantee you. And we'll drink some wine. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. And don't forget thank to uh, sus subscribe to the Downtown Podcast on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter and Vine. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. That work? Yeah. That's good. Thank you. So... You were a little shy when I brought you up, but I'm sure you're going to do just fine. So as the fortune cookie passed through the audience, you were the one that it ended at. So yes. you get the amazing honor of announcing what the fortune of the week is for us. Okay. So what is that fortune that you heard? I make big stuff. <laughs> I, I, that's what I was told. <laughs> The actual fortune of the week was make stuff awesome, but I like this one better, thank oh, you. Cool, <laughs> well, yay! So uh, please give Pramis a round of applause. She's been fantastic, hasn't she? Thank you. <laughs> thank you, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>